So we'll start with the case. Uh, so a 15 year old male, this was a, a patient I saw a couple of months ago. So he presented with two weeks of worsening shortness of breath and lethargy. Uh, his blood pressure was 65 on 40, heart rate 120. Breast spread, a little bit elevated, even for his age, but saturating well, uh, afebrile, and he was alert. So uh, yeah, I was asked to see him by one of the PEDS EM consultants. Uh, they just happened to, I wasn't doing PEDS, they just happened to know I was around and they thought an ultrasound might be useful because it was basically a case of undifferentiated shock. So they had no idea why his blood pressure was low. Uh, there was quite a broad differential, you know, it could have been hypovolemic, it could have been a cardiogenic, obstructive. They, had, they didn't really have any clues on the history or the exam. Uh, so he'd only been there a few minutes. You know, they're just sort of putting a line in, getting some fluids going. He hadn't had any, we didn't have any gas or x-ray. We didn't really have much information. And so I just went in and did a scan. And this is what I saw. So, um, would someone like to comment on this? Feel, just feel free to just unmute yourself and comment. Firstly, what view is it? Flex, isn't it? Parastonal long. Flex, yeah, excellent. Parastonal long axis, very good. Uh, so just for those of you who are a bit new to this, uh, I'll just point out what all the structures are. Uh, so this is the left atrium here. This is the mitral valve opening and closing. This is the left ventricle in long axis. Uh, this is, you can just see a little bit of right ventricle up here and then a little bit of descending thoracic aorta here. Yes, we call this the parasternal long axis view. So when you put the probe just next to the sternum, parasternal, usually in about the fourth intercostal space with the marker to the patient's uh, right shoulder, this is what you see. Uh, so this is a great view for the left ventricle because you see it lengthened out there and you can really assess its function well. So what do you think about the LV function here? Normal or abnormal? I'm gonna take a stab at ab abnormal, but I'm completely prepared yeah. to be wrong. It doesn't, doesn't look like <laughs> it's doing a huge amount. Yeah. Are we are we assuming that the image is is not just jittering along because of its quality, but that that's the rhythm of the heart? Oh, there is. It could be jerky because of the connection, possibly. But all right, uh, okay. it was a normal rhythm. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, the LV function is impaired. A nice way to just eyeball LV function is if you imagine a point in the middle of the LV where I've got my laser pointer hovered, the walls should come in towards that point by about a third. So fractional shortening should be about a third, 30%. That relates to a normal ejection fraction. And if you look at how this free wall and how this septum, how much they're moving down towards that point in the middle, uh, it's definitely less than a third, isn't it? So there's definitely impaired LV systolic function. Uh, are you able to admit people while I'm talking as well, Matt? Yeah, cool. So um, yeah, there's really four things that we look for uh, on ultrasound in terms of sort of level one echo and life support. Uh, so one is LV function, which we've just talked about. Uh, the other ones are if there's any pericardial fluid. Uh, so pericardial fluid, you normally see sort of behind the heart and then coming in front of the descending thoracic aorta here, like a black sort of anechoic rim, uh, and there's no fluid there. The other things we look for are signs of RV strain, which you might see in a massive or submassive PE. But here the RV, from what we can see, seems normal. And the final thing would be hypovolemia. So if there was a really empty LV with kissing walls uh, and a collapsing IVC, which we'll see later, uh, that could be signs of hypovolemia. So they're the four things we look for. And so far in this view, yeah, all we can see is that there's impaired LV function, but none of those other uh, signs are present. Cool. So this next image. Uh, so yeah, there are some ways you can quantify LV function. There are some measurements that you can use. Um, in general, I'd suggest uh, sort of more qualitative eyeballing methods are probably more reliable. You can get into trouble doing too many measurements, but this is one measurement that I do find quite useful. Uh, does anyone know what this is called? Feel free to shout out if you know. EPSS. EPSS, yeah, who is that? Uh, that's Chris from Homerton. 
Oh, Chris, excellent work. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, what I'm doing here is basically using M mode. So we're putting the M mode line down here, which isolates just a line along that single plane. So this is if you've, you're just looking at one crystal and the beam that's shining from that one crystal and you're ignoring the rest of the probe. And then we're looking what's going on down that line over time. So here from the top, we've got, we've got the septum here. Then this is the black bit is the LV chamber. This thing that's moving is the mitral valve, the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve that's flapping up and down. And then we've got a bit of free wall of the LV here. So as we go down the y-axis of this graph, that's relating to what's along the line on this M mode line, yeah? And so what that allows you to do is isolate what's happening to various structures across time. So it's great for sort of looking at valve movement. Uh, so we can see the mitral valve lead moving up and down here. And if you measure, uh, so it's the septum there, it's the mitral valve there. And the, uh, the point where the mitral valve gets closest to the septum is called the E point. And if you look at the separation between the E point and the septum, that's called the E point septal separation or EPSS. Uh, and that can be a useful marker of LV function. So if it's less than seven millimeters, then that's a pretty reliable uh, marker of good LV function. Uh, so it sort of rules out significant LV impairment, whereas if it's more than seven millimeters, that could suggest impaired LV function. And here it's just over a centimeter, so over 10 millimeters. So that's, um, that gap is too wide. So that anterior leaflet of the mitral valve should slap up and hit the septum. Uh, and then it's not, it's leaving a big gap. So if I go back to that first image, you can see it should be slapping up and hitting the septum here, but it's leaving a gap there. Uh, so you can just eyeball that as well. But if you want to measure it on M mode, that will give you a more accurate idea. Okay, so that was a couple of things on the parasonal long axis. Now this is the parasonal short axis. So we've rotated the probe 90 degrees. So now the marker is to the patient's left shoulder. And yeah, my professor from Teesside, Bob Jarman, calls this the pastry view. Uh, I don't know if he's used that one on you yet, Matt, but he relates everything to food. And uh, so here we've got the the short, the uh, a cross section through the LV here, which should be nice and round like a donut. And then the RV should be rounded around it like a croissant. So the donut and the croissant view. So this is a great view for looking for RV dilation and septal flattening, which you can see in a massive PE. So then you get the septum becomes flattened. And so instead of an O, instead of a donut, it becomes like a D because this septum is flattened. But it's also a good view for looking at LV function. So again, if we imagine a spot in the middle, the walls should come towards that by a third and they're not coming towards it by anywhere near a third, are they? It's not really moving much at all. Uh, but you can also assess whether uh, the LV impairment is more global or more regional. So if it was regional, um, so you can pick up regional wall motion abnormality on echo. Um, I mean, as a sort of a basic idea, like the, the left anterior descending tends to supply sort of the anterior part of the heart and then the circumflex more the lateral part and the right coronary is more the inferior part. And if you want to go into the details of it, there's actually 17 different regions if you do it properly, but sometimes you can just eyeball that it's only one part of the heart that's not moving and you can get an idea that it could be a regional wall motion abnormality. But I think here you'd agree it's pretty global. All the different parts of the wall are all sort of not moving well, but equally. And this is another uh, sort of uh, level of the parasternal short axis. So now I've tilted the probe up towards the base of the heart to bring in the aortic valve here in the middle. And the only reason I showed you this one is because there's a useful adaptation to this view that you can do, which isn't part of the standard views. But if you just slightly angle your probe from that parasternal short axis aortic valve level, you can bring out this structure here. Does anyone know what this is? This black structure coming down here and then bifurcating. It's the pulmonary uh, outflow tract. It's the yeah, pulmonary it's, arteries. But Chris again. Very good. No, yeah, not so, this time. Oh, sorry. That was I won't. I won't take credit for that. <laughs> no, okay. Well done, whoever what that was. Yes, yeah, so this is the pulmonary artery bifurcating into the right and left pulmonary arteries, and so this is a useful view because if there is a big saddle embolus, uh, 
And if the patient's shocked, you know, it's probably going to be something like a big saddle embolus. If it is a PE, uh, you can sometimes actually directly identify it there. Okay, and then this is obviously the apical four chamber. So we've got the probe up here at the apex. We've got the left side of the heart here on the right of screen and the right side of the heart on the left of screen. So for the apical four chamber, you want the septum right down the middle and you want all the chambers lengthened out as long as possible. So it's a tricky view to get because the apex can be a bit variable where it lies, but if you can get a good view, it gives you a lot of information because you can see all the chambers together. And would anyone like to comment on this view? What do you think? What are the main findings? Otherwise, I'll just pick on people that I know. I will speak if you want, but it looks as if the RV is, is very, well, is of a similar size to the LV. So the ratios between the RV and the LV would suggest that actually there's um, poor form. Well, it looks like there's biatrial dilatation as well. So it looks like there's just general dilatation of the, the structure of the heart. Mm -hmm. And in terms of the LV function, what do you think? Uh, I'm not going to comment on your actual scans because that, no, Andrew, <laughs> that would be rude. Um, I, I, it doesn't look like there's very good, um, uh, what am I talking about? Top to bottom kind of contraction. That's not the actual yep. word for it, but you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. um, torsional yep. Longer uh, contraction. Long okay. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. So if you see reduced LB function like on one image, it's always good to look at the other images uh, to get sort of more of an overall picture because yeah, there are different fibers that. Uh, run in different directions. You have longitudinal fibers, which contract the LV from apex to base, but then there are also radial fibers and oblique fibers. And so, you know, depending on what part of the heart's affected, you might only see uh, reduced function in a certain plane. So you should always, you know, get as many different windows as you can and piece it together. But I think you'd agree from all the windows that we've seen, there's been sort of globally reduced functioning throughout. And yeah, the RV is also impaired, I'd say. Um, there are a couple of quantitative um, markers of LV and RV function you may have heard of called MAPSI and TAPSI. Uh, so MAPSI is uh, the mitral annulus, which is just here. Uh, so mitral, mitral annular uh, plane systolic excursions, basically how much this, this part of the heart here is moving up and down towards uh, the apex and back towards the base. And that should be at least a centimeter. And then TAPSI is tricuspid annular plane systolic excursion. So it's the same thing, but on the right side of the heart. Uh, and so it's basically how much this is moving up and down. And MAPSI should be at least one centimeter, TAPSI should be at least two centimeters as a sort of, um, uh, just to kind of round it off, make it easy to remember. And you can see both of them are reduced. This is not moving up and down a centimeter and this is not moving two centimeters. So there's some signs of both LV and RV impairment, I would say. Okay, how about this is the IVC? What do you think of that? Greg? Or anyone who'd like to jump in? Hi, oh, sorry, I'm in quiet mode. Yeah. Um, uh, so it's certainly not collapsing a great deal on inspiration. It's not pl plethoric, but it looks quite plump. Yep, excellent, yeah. Yeah, I think it's, it might be, I don't know how, come, how well this comes through on the, on, the, um, on the Zoom, but it looks like maybe it's, there's a bit of collapse here, but I think actually that's because as the patient's breathing in and out, or the probe's just slipping slightly off the midline. And so that can be a bit of a trap when you look for collapsibility in the IVC on long, long axis. You, your probe can easily sort of slip off the middle of the vein as the patient's breathing in and out. So I think it's always good to examine IVC on both long and short axis, because if you're looking on short axis, you know, it can't slip off the plane of your probe because it's right in the middle of the screen there. But yeah, overall, I'd agree. It um, doesn't look like it's collapsing much and it's quite thick. I think if we measured that, it was over two centimeters. So a dilated IVC. Okay, uh, and then we'll talk a bit about shock protocols in a sec, but I've now jumped to the lung. So we've done heart, we've done IVC, and now we're doing lung. And this is the right sort of anterior lung. So looking for a pneumothorax. So I'm basically looking to, for whether sliding is present or not. And yeah, it is present. So we can see this shimmering along the pleural line there. So there is lung sliding. So there's no pneumothorax at that point. And then on the left as well, no lungs 
Uh, so they're just line sliding there, so no pneumothorax there either. I also looked um, at the lateral lung. What do you think of this? So this is right lateral lung. Anyone like to comment on that? Multiple, multiple B-lines yep. from the looks there. Yep. Yeah, definitely. So yeah, you're allowed sort of one or two B-lines in the bases in older people, but yeah, this is a 15 year old and it's like sort of a mid lateral area and there's, there's like definitely more than three B-lines there. So it's definitely abnormal, very good. And so then I actually switched to the low frequency probe just to get a bit more of a uh, sort of over, overall perspective of the lungs. So we can, we can see a few different intercostal spaces here. Um, I'm not on a lung preset and I've actually got uh, compound imaging on, which is very naughty. That's why some of these B lines are splitting into sort of three different B lines. So for lung, if your machine doesn't have a lung preset, you should actually turn your compounding and your harmonics off and that'll make the B lines more like a single line and it'll make them easier to see. So here actually, because I've got my settings wrong, it's interfering with the image, but you can still see you know, there are multiple B lines in several spaces there on the right. But on the left, looks pretty clear, right? We can just see the plural line and no B lines. So, so the B lines are all just on the right side. Okay, and then, so at this point, uh, I said to the PEDS consultant, okay, so the main findings so far are um, severely impaired and globally impaired uh, by ventricular function, dilated IVC, and some B lines on the right. Um, and this was just a couple of months ago. So, you know, peak of the pandemic. So yeah, what would you guys be thinking at this point? What's sort of a, a unifying diagnosis for this young man? Myocarditis. But Kurushi, yeah. Yep. yep. D. Michael, we, we put some stuff also on the chat. Oh, if, cool. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Yeah, feel free to interrupt, Matt, if you're monitoring the chat, if you want to interrupt and ask some of the questions on the chat, that's fine. Uh, yeah, so uh, and how about the, the B-lines on the right? What could they represent, do you think? If you have focal B-lines, what are the main differentials for focal B-lines? Well, one of them is pulmonary edema, isn't it? Yeah, so pulmonary edema can cause B-lines, but it tends to be more bilateral. So it would normally be in a more symmetrical dependent distribution sometimes with pleural effusions. Whereas this guy, he didn't have any pleural effusions. He just had some B-lines on the right, which would- so Michael, we've got a couple of people saying pneumonia, focal pneumonia. Yep. COVID, yep. Uh, PIMS, TS has been postulated as well. Excellent, yeah. Yeah, very good. Uh, quite a few COVIDs as well. Yep. Yeah, so if you, if you go by the Liechtenstein's original sort of blue protocol, he talks about different profiles. So A profile is where it's just A lines all the way, which is normal. B profile is where there's B lines on bilaterally, which is more like pulmonary edema. And then AB profile is where you have A lines on one side and B lines on the other side. So just unilateral B lines. And that's usually more a sign of infection. There can be other things. Uh, trauma can also cause it if you get a lung contusion, but there hadn't been any trauma here. So uh, it was more in keeping with infection. Uh, so yeah, we'd already got the main information. And then I went back to, uh, to do a few more scans just to quantify things a bit more. This is the MAPSI that we mentioned. So you can see that mitral annulus is not moving much, less than a centimeter there. Uh, and I also went back and did a bit of color Doppler. Yeah, that's how you measure MAPSI. Uh, and then to do color, color Doppler. So you put the color Doppler box over the left atrium and we can see there's this little blue yellow jet there's a bit of eccentric mitral regurgitation, uh, but this, you don't really need to do any of these advanced things. I think just from those basic uh, two dimensional views on B mode, we've really got all the information we need actually. So um, we'll talk a bit about the protocols later and there's a system called HindMap, which I tend to use uh, just as a kind of a structure for patients with undifferentiated shock. So in terms of this chap, uh, H is for heart. So I'd say he had globally and severely impaired uh, biventricular function. I is for IVC, which I think was plethoric, dilated, not collapsing much. Uh, M is for Morrison's pouch or free fluid. And we didn't scan that in this chat. Didn't think it was really relevant. And we already had an answer from the first couple of 
items. Uh, also aorta, not so relevant in this age group. Uh, pleura uh, was relevant and yeah, there were right-sided B lines. So yeah, that was uh, the findings. And I think you'd agree like going from a, a position of really having no idea what's going on with this young man, we immediately could diagnose him with cardiogenic shock plus a possible pneumonia. So uh, it's just super useful information. This, this was all within about two or three minutes of him arriving well before he'd had any chest x-rays or blood tests. So uh, actually I'm gonna skip over that bit for now. And so we'll just go back to basics next and talk about the types of shock. So I'm sure you're all familiar uh, from medical school, the, the main sort of uh, physiological types of shock. So we have hypovolemic, cardiogenic, obstructive and distributive. Uh, and ultra, as we'll see, ultrasound can be useful in each of these types of shock. Um, so there's one sort of system of conceptualizing uh, how to use ultrasound in shock, which is the RUSH protocol, which talks about the pump, uh, pump pipes and tank. I'm sorry. Yep. So in hypovolemic shock, you'd expect the pump to be hyperdynamic and the LV is often empty, a small chamber size. Uh, the tank, uh, so a flat IVC, and there may be a cause of the hypovolemia, so free fluid either in the chest or in the abdomen. And then in terms of the, uh, the pipes, there may be a cause of hypovolemia as well, so a AAA or an aortic dissection. In cardiogenic shock, you tend to see a hypodynamic or impaired ventricular function. Uh, if it's relatively chronic, it may also be dilated. In terms of the tank, the IVC will be plethoric, so dilated, uh, non-collapsible. There may be free fluid and also B lines in the chest, but they'd be more sort of symmetrical dependent B lines. In terms of obstructive shock, um, so obviously there's a few different causes of obstructive shock. We've got tamponade, uh, massive PE, tension pneumothorax being the main three. So in tamponade, Matt will talk about that later, but that's Obviously, ultrasound is the, the main way of diagnosing that. RV strain uh, and, excuse me, uh, but whatever the cause of the obstructive shock, you'll always see a plethoric IVC. So IVC is a great thing to look at in shock because if you see a narrow collapsible IVC, you can pretty much immediately discount all the causes of obstructive shock. You, know, you can rule out potential pneumothorax, a, um, a massive PE and tamponade. You know, if you've got a, any of those conditions should cause your IVC to be um, uh, to be dilated. So if it's narrow and collapsible, you can rule those out. And then finally, in terms of distributive shock, it's probably the one cause of the one sort of uh, subgroup of shock where ultrasound is least useful. So distributive shock is like septic shock or anaphylactic shock. Uh, so you would you can see a hyper or a hypodynamic heart. Uh, you can see a flat or a normal IVC. Um, so it's not as useful, but in terms of septic shock, you could potentially identify the source of the sepsis. So it could still be useful from that perspective. So you could see a pneumonia or a cholecystitis or a hydronephrosis that's causing urosepsis or something like that. Okay, so that's a kind of a conceptual way of thinking about ultrasound in shock. Uh, and there are loads of protocols of how to actually use it. So yeah, please don't create another one. We've, we've got about 20 of them already. Uh, and they all have you know, cool sounding mnemonics. Uh, but yeah, the one I think that is probably most used and that is quite easy to remember is the high map, which is um, uh, the one that Scott Weingart came up with. Uh, and it stands for heart, IVC, Morrison's pouch, aorta and pleura. So yeah, it's easy to remember because you know, the idea is you want your patient to have a high map, you know, they're hypotensive. And, and yeah, that all those protocols, you know, they all look at uh, basically heart and IVC, most of them look at lungs and then it's kind of a variable amount of aorta and fast and other things. But I think this is a, it's a good system because it's got all the main things there, uh, but you don't have to stick to it rigidly. You can adapt it. You know, in this young chap, we weren't so interested in his aorta, for example. Uh, but if, if on the, the heart view, you see some RV dilation, uh, you might add in a DVT scan, for example. So you know, I think we should try and individualize and tailor the approach to the patient, just like we do with our examination. You know, you pick up clues in the history, which lead you to examine certain parts of the body. 
you know, in the same way, any clues that you pick up in your clinical assessment will lead you to uh, assess certain parts of the body with ultrasound. Okay, so next I've just got a few examples to demonstrate the things that we're looking for with this uh, sort of structured shock scan. Uh, anyone like to shout this one out? So this black area here at the top is fluid. So fluid appears black or anechoic on echoes. So this is pericardial fluid. And is there any signs of tamponade? Is the next question. Yes. Yes, very good. Yes. Yeah. So we can see this, the artery free wall is, is dipping in, isn't it? It's, uh, it's being compressed. So there is definitely signs of tamponade there. And Matt will talk more about that later. How about this heart? So this is the apical four chamber. Is this um, normal or hypodynamic or hyperdynamic? Looks quite hyperdynamic. Hyperdynamic, yeah. So this could fit with sepsis or hypovolemia. Yeah, very good. And how about this? We've got, this is a parasternal long axis here, and this is the parasternal short axis. What's the main finding here? Nice image. Um, looks like RV dilatation and acute strain with uh, septal bowing of the uh, LV. Yeah, yeah, so this is the RV here on the parasternal long. So on the, the image from the case, you could hardly see the RV. So here it's, it's massively dilated. It's bigger than the LV. Uh, and the LV chamber is actually quite empty which is quite a typical thing you see in an acute PE because the blood just doesn't get around to the LV. So the LV often appears quite empty. Yeah, and here on the parasternal short axis, we can see that D sign. So instead of the LV being a nice round donut shape with just a nice thin croissant around it, we've got like a mega croissant here and the septums become flattened and the LVs become like a capital D. Okay, and here's a couple of different IVCs. So here we have the right atrium and the IVC here, some hepatic veins here. And yeah, this is plethoric or engorged. So it's, it's more than two centimeters and it's not collapsing at all. And then how about this one? So here's the RV here. This is the IVC coming down here. Anyone like IVC to thrombus. IVC thrombus, yes, very good, Angus. Yeah, this is a big clot in the IVC. So keep your eye out for that. That is a potential finding you can see when you're looking at the IVC as well. Very good. And how about this IVC? Normal, plethoric, collapsed. Collapsible. Yep, very good. Yeah, so you can hardly see it. It's like a slit, isn't it? It's just this very thin structure coming out here. So yeah, if a patient's really hypovolemic and the IVC is slit-like, it can be difficult to even see it at all. And it can be quite tricky to actually um, get your beam on such a, a thin, narrow structure, but that's it there. Great. Okay, so we've talked about heart and then IVC, and now we've, we're moving on to M, Morrison's pouch. So here we have a right upper quadrant view showing some free fluid here with the tip of the liver floating in the fluid. And here, this is a pelvic view with some around the bladder and here with some fluid between the spleen and the diaphragm. So I'm sure you're all familiar with free fluid from your fast exams. And then the next part of the high map is aorta. So here's a big chunky AAA. I think this measured at about seven centimeters. So we always measure from outer to outer wall, including the thrombus within the clot. So in terms of shock, if you see a AAA, it doesn't necessarily tell you it's ruptured, but if the patient's shock and there's no, uh, shocked and there's no other obvious cause of the shock, then the fine AO AAA would obviously make you very suspicious that it's a ruptured AAA. And here, Anyone like to comment on this picture? This is a longitudinal aorta. Dissection. Dissection, yes, excellent. So yeah, as well as looking at the diameter for a AAA, keep your eye out for any flaps as well. So here we see a flap here, flapping away. Very good. So yeah, we've talked about heart, IVC, Morrison's aorta, and then the final bit of the high map is the P for pleura. So, what do you think of this picture? Anyone like to comment? Lots of feline. Confluent, yeah. yeah. 
yeah, confluent B lines, and they're sort of evenly distributed, aren't they? So we can see three different intercostal spaces here, and the B lines are pretty much equally distributed between them. And the plural line is actually quite thin and smooth. So as opposed to COVID, where you tend to get more patchy disease, often with some plural irregularity or little subplural consolidations, this would look, this would be more sort of a typical finding of pulmonary edema. And if you saw that bilaterally with effusions and reduced uh, ventricular function, that would all build up a picture of acute heart failure. Okay, and then, yeah, what do you think about this image? This is, um, this is the right sort of lower zone. So the head is to the, patient's head is to the left of screen, patient's feet to the right of screen. What can we see there? It's quite an impressive pneumonia. Yeah, yeah great. So this is the liver here. Uh, this is the diaphragm here, the bright white line. And then above the diaphragm, this looks kind of like the liver tissue, right? So sometimes some people call this hepatization of the lung. So the lung has become like sonographically like the liver. And if you look closely, you can even see some tiny little air bubbles moving up and down within the consolidated lung there, which are called dynamic air bronchograms, which uh, are more specific to consolidation rather than atelectasis. So yeah. In terms of P for pleura, as well as looking for pneumonia, we're also looking for things like heart failure and consolidation. Okay, so that was a quick sort of run through the HIMAP exam. Uh, next, I just want to take you through a little bit of the evidence for using point of care ultrasound for undifferentiated shock. And the first paper is by a man called Shokui, uh, who I guess was born to write this paper on uh, ultrasound and shock, really. So in 2015, he performed this quite fairly small prospective study uh, looking at patients with undifferentiated shock. So there was no obvious cause. So if they're known to have a AAA or they're known to be uh, in early pregnancy, you know, they were excluded. It was only undifferentiated shock, which basically all the studies uh, are, are on that group. Uh, it was defined as a systolic blood pressure of less than 90 after fluids. Uh, and the primary outcome was, uh, did ultrasound help uh, reduce the diagnostic uncertainty? Uh, he found, yes, it did. There was a significant reduction and it also led to a change in treatment. Uh, it changed imaging and referral. So it led to a change in management. So this was one of the early papers, just to kind of uh, give you a bit of a, a flavor of how we've got to where we are. Then a couple of years later, uh, this paper by Sazmaz, uh, slightly bigger paper from Turkey, similar kind of inclusion criteria and also similar exclusion. So if there was a clear cause or if they were pregnant or trauma. So all these studies are talking about non-traumatic uh, shock or if there was ST elevation on the ECG, that was they were all excluded. And they looked at whether the initial diagnosis with ultrasound correlated with the final diagnosis. And so they looked at uh, patients without POCUS. So patients were yeah, randomized into without POCUS or with POCUS. And he found that there was significant better correlation with final diagnosis in patients who received focus. Um, and the main finding that led to a change in diagnosis was myocardial ischemia, so regional wall motion abnormality. Uh, then there was a paper that you may have heard about um, by Atkinson in 2018, which tried to show a mortality benefit to using ultrasound in shock. So this was an even bigger center, a multi-center randomized trial looking at adults with undifferentiated shock. Um, and the finding was that there was no difference in survival. So it was a negative trial. There was no mortality benefit to um, patients who had an ultrasound for undifferentiated shock. And there's also no difference in length of stay or in fluids or inotropes or in uh, use of CT. Uh, but yeah, there was quite a lot of um, sort of talk about this and you know, whether we should be using ultrasound in shock given there's no mortality benefits uh, and so so um, several people pointed out some of the limitations of this trial. I think the main one was that there was a lot of exclusions. Um, I think because this was 2018 and it was um, performed in North America where focus was already well established for patients in shock and it was you know, being used routinely for patients um, with undifferentiated shock already, they had to exclude a lot of patients uh, to be able to get it through their ethics committee. So patients with suspected AAA or suspected ectopic uh, were all excluded. And so in the end, it was actually mostly occult sepsis that the patients actually had, which is probably the condition where ultrasound is least useful, as we'll see. Uh, so yeah, I think a lot of 
uh, Pocus proponents um, sort of took this paper with a pinch of salt and they thought, well, okay, you didn't manage to show a mortality benefit, but there were so many exclusions, uh, you know, we're not sure if, uh, if that's actually valid because it was already, uh, it was, the, the, the study was performed at a time when Pocus was already being used quite a lot. Uh, also, they used quite a rigid protocol um, rather than sort of an individually tailored protocol where you sort of follow clues in the clinical exam and the preceding part of your ultrasound exam to, you know, to lead on to the rest of the ultrasound exam. Uh, in 2019, uh, in India, they performed another small study looking at the diagnostic accuracy of point of care ultrasound for the different types of shock. Uh, so for hypovolemic shock, it was pretty good. Cardiogenic, pretty good. Obstructive was actually the best. Uh, and distributive, which includes sepsis, was the least accurate. And then there was a systematic review and meta-analysis just a couple of years ago, where they also looked at diagnostic accuracy. Uh, sorry for the busy slide here, but I'll just walk you through it. So again, in terms of the sensitivity uh, and specificity, obstructive was the most accurate. Uh, but distributive was the least. And then they also have the positive and negative likelihood ratios is here, here as well. So obstructive shock, uh, there was a positive likelihood ratio of 40 and a negative likelihood ratio of 0 0.1. Uh, whereas for a distributive shock uh, and hypovolemic shock, it was less. Uh, so yeah, it seems like ultrasound, uh, sorry. So in terms of a, sort of a summary of the evidence, uh, I would say there is pretty solid evidence for ultrasound in undifferentiated shock in terms of diagnostic accuracy uh, and that it is best for obstructive shock and worst for distributive shock. Uh, and we haven't managed to show any uh, evidence of mortality benefit. Uh, so the International Federation of Emergency Medicine um, came up with this consensus statement in 2016 uh, recommending a sort of a standardized approach to using ultrasound in undifferentiated shock. And they talk about the core views, which is a couple of echo views plus lung and IVC. And then supplementary views, which would be like further echo views, like an apical four chamber, for example. And then additional views, which are kind of optional depending on what you find in your initial views. So as we said, if your echo shows you know, RV dilation, you may look for a DVT. Whereas if, uh, if your echo and your IVC suggest hypovolemia, you may go searching for a cause of that hypovolemia, like looking for AAA or free fluid. I think this makes sense. You know, this is a kind of an intelligent way of using ultrasound to follow the clues. And they also talk about the four Fs, which are pericardial fluid, ventricular form and function, pleural fluid or B-lines, and filling status. And they have a beautiful little infographic here where they have the core as the sort of the red inner core and then supplementary views and then additional views. And yeah, I think this is, this is how I really think about it. Um, I quite like using the high map mnemonic because it just gives you an easy to remember structure, uh, but I actually use it more uh, like this in practice with sort of core views, look at the heart, IVC and the lungs, and then you're adding in different views depending on what I find in those initial views. Cool, so. Uh, any questions before I hand over to the blunderbuss, Matt Blundell? Thanks, Michael. That was great. There's no, there's no real questions on the chat. Um, just in terms of the, just a few additional bits. So, in terms of the high map, I use the high map quite a lot. I think for echo, it's really, it's really, really useful to kind of get in there early doors, especially with hypertensive patients. So, the other thing to notice when you have someone with an acutely acute dilated RV, it's really important to obviously look at the ECG because sometimes I've been stung by thinking it was a PE and actually it's a right ventricular infarction. So you have fairly similar looking echo findings with someone with an RV infarction, so it's good to look at the IVC, um, the ECG. Um, and if you do think someone's got an acute PE, just have a quick look at the femoral veins as well because you often see a clot sitting there as well that can help, help kind of nail your diagnosis. Yep. Great point. Any other questions from the floor? Oh, by the way, yeah, the case from the beginning, it was a PIMS in the end. Yeah, it was a young chap who'd had COVID recently uh, and then had got a secondary bacterial pneumonia and then had myocarditis from the, the PIMS, so the, the pediatric inflammatory multisystem disorder. Uh, yeah, any other questions 
stand into silence. So I'll just post on the chat uh, a couple of links. Uh, one is a link to uh, Core Ultrasound, is like an umbrella website that has uh, five minutes sono as well as the ultrasound podcast. And there's a great sort of five minute sono video of how to do a high map exam. Uh, and then I'll also post uh, a really nice sort of narrative review of the evidence for shock that was just published last year as well. So um, I'll post those on the chat now. And are you able to share your screen, Matt, or do I need to make yeah, you post? You can. I can do that now, yeah. Great. Uh, Over to you then, mate. Thank you very much. I, just... um, I think you need to disable oh. the screen sharing to let me. I've made you the host. Hopefully that will hmm. allow you to share your screen. Uh, yep. Uh, good. Okay, can everyone see? Can you see that? Yep. Cool. Yep. Perfect. Amazing. So, Michael, if you could just moderate and go through any questions. Um, yep. So my name's Matt Blundell. I'm a fellow consultant in emergency medicine. St. Thomas is with Michael. Um, I also dabble in a bit of clinical toxicology once a week as well. Um, and I am a self-proclaimed POCUS fanboy, I think. Ultrasound is great. I think the more I use it, the more useful I think it is. I think it's something that will um, and should become into kind of our day-to-day um, -day basis of uh, clinical assessments. So Michael's already given away the kind of theme of my uh, presentation, but I think it's not a very crypt cryptic uh, title and there we say I'm going to go through a quick case um, and then kind of go through some finer points in terms of a bit of evidence and then show you some pretty ultrasound pictures uh, please feel free to kind of jump in with any questions at any point so um, in ED at St Thomas's we are a tertiary centre for cardiothoracic so we often get referrals from DGHs and this is a, a case about two months ago of a 38 year old male presented to uh, South London D District General Hospital with severe central pleuritic chest pain um, radiating through to the back. Um, he, someone who had done a point of care ultrasound in the District General Hospital and had noted uh, there's a small sliver of pericardial free fluid. Um, patient's gone on to have a CTA also. And this has been reported by the on-call radiology um, registrar as a query type A aortic dissection. So he's been Packed away in an ambulance and sent to St. Thomas's en route. The cardiothoracic ridge has come down and said he's looked at the scans and health. He's not convinced it's a type A aortic dissection. Um, and they, they wanted to get an ECG gated aortic dissection to rule in and rule, rule out the um, dissection. So it was pretty uneventful transfer when he came into recess. Um, he was obviously in still in discomfort. He had quite a bit of morphine actually um, with the ambulance and, and the prior hospital. Um, but he's still complaining kind of nine out of ten um, central chest pain. Um, slightly tachypneic, tachycardic, his ECG just showed sinus tachy, uh, and his blood pressure, someone who was 38 and wasn't hypertensive, kind of had mild hypertension. So whilst we're waiting for his um, ECG gated um, CTA also, I decided to do uh, an echo, which we'd like to do. Um, so this is the image that I got. I'm just going to pop my uh, pointer, sorry. So, so it's not too dissimilar to what Michael showed earlier. So this is a parasomal long axis view. Um, and you can see um, this rim of fluid around the heart anteriorly and posteriorly. Um, we've got the right ventricle at the top, the septum, and the left ventricle at the bottom here. And you can see quite an important part, this free wall of the right ventricular outflow tract. You just see it ever so slightly divots in. Um, during part of the cardiac cycle. And if you, if we were to slow down this video, we'd be able to show you that actually it divots in when the mitral valve is opening. And when the mitral valve opens, or the tricuspid valve opens, that corresponds to ventricular diastole. So you can actually, this term is the term vent, um, diastolic collapse of the right ventricle, and that's the kind of sign of um, tamponade. Um, We've got some, uh, started to measure it. So it's uh, 
funneling through, you can you can find the, the biggest area to measure. So on the parasol or long axis, it's about a centimeter, just over a centimeter, just another quick to a moderate sized pleural effusion. Um, just confirms the effusion again. It's always good to get several views. So this is a parasol short axis view, and again you can see this pleural fluid around the anterior and posterior walls as well. And then, sadly, I don't have a video of this, but this is a um, this is a screenshot of his IVC. And as Michael noted earlier, it's kind of the size of it quite important. Also, the respiratory variations. This was measured at 2.3 centimeters, so fairly plethoric, and there's kind of minimal um, respiratory variation um, when he was breathing in and out. So less than there was less than 50% collapse during um, inspiration. So we were left with the coronary. So this is a what would appear to be a hemodynamically stable gentleman who's come in with a query dissecting and evidence of pleural fluid, um, pericardial fluid. Um, so does anyone at this point, would anyone call this tamponard? Feel free to shout out. Yeah. You would. So if you think it's tamponard, what do you think the management of that tamponard is at this point? So would anyone pop a needle into his pericardial space to aspirate this fluid. He's not hypotensive. Yeah. And he's mildly tachycardic at 180. Yeah, there's about 100, 110, 120, yeah. And he's not, and he's saturating 100% on it. Saturating 100%, quite so, tachy and nick though, kind of 22, 23. Yeah. There's obviously ultrasound evidence of tamponade. Yeah. And so it wouldn't take much if his observations were to change um, to, mm -hmm. to warrant a pericardiosynthesis, yes. Mm -hmm. um, this would be the time where you've got ultrasound evidence to get him to a cath lab where you could then do that under, under kind of uh, guidance, I imagine. Yeah, good. So we, uh, we actually, obviously, we, we, we still haven't ruled out this uh, aortic dissection, so he, still needed, he needed to go to CT. So. Obviously, we had the cardiology were coming down as well. We had the kit ready if we needed to, but we felt he was currently stable enough to go to CT and undergo the CT um, with kind of obviously equipment ready to go if we needed to. Um, but yeah, you're kind of right. So tamponade itself, it's not really a purely clinical diagnosis. Neither is it purely an echo diagnosis. It's kind of a combination of the two. Um, if you actually look down with the actual gold standard diagnosis of tamponade, it's actually it's a retrospective diagnosis. So if you, you, if you take fluid out and you get an improvement in the hemodynamic status, that therefore then is a tamponade. So sadly, unfortunately, you're not going to be able to aspirate fluid on every single patient who comes in with a pericardial effusion with possible signs of tamponade. So we have to use our kind of clinical evidence in front of us, what does the patient look like, what's our observations, What's the etiology we think, and also we use our echo findings as well. So I'll go a little bit through kind of tamponade physiology just to kind of have a clearer understanding because it helps um, kind of bring some of the later echo findings to to fruit to forebear. So um, you can't talk about tamponade without obviously talking about the pericardium. So very brief anatomy lesson. So um, pericardium is made up of several layers. You have this kind of fibrous, thick outer pericardium that doesn't really stretch very well when um, fluid fills in the pericardial space. And, and that's attached to the serous pericardium, which is made up of the parietal pericardium and the visceral pericardium. And in between those two layers, you have the pericardial cavity. You can normally have up to about 50 mils of physiological fluid um, in the pericardium. Obviously, when that increases more, you can pick it up um, with, um, with your echo probe. And it's mainly to do with the kind of the, the, uh, the rate of accumulation is the most important point. So if you do have pericardial um, effusions, this is a parasitic long axis. You want to fan um, in and out through each, each um, area you're looking at to kind of find the biggest pocket and then measure it. And it allows you to give you a kind of a crude estimate of how much fluid you think you have. So small, kind of less than one centimeter effusion would be less than 100 mils. Moderate, which our um, patient had you know, between one to two centimeters, up to 500 mils. Anything over two centimeters is um, kind of 500 mils. Um, but as I said, it's more to do with the, the rate of accumulation and the, the subsequent pericardial compliance that's an important factor. The size, yes, does have some impact on, on whether you're going to get tamponade. But as you can see from this kind of um, this graph, that if you have a rapid effusion, such as you get with a traumatic um, pericardial effusion, or you've got someone with an inflammatory pericardial effusion, it rapidly develops and doesn't give time for that thick fibrous pericardium time to stretch. So you kind of reach this 
limit a pericardial stretch threshold and beyond that you can tamponade. Whereas someone with a slower effusion that's developed over months or maybe years, someone with hypothyroidism or a malignant pericardial effusion, they can have up to a litre, a litre and a half, sometimes even more before they reach this limit um, because it's allowed time for fibrous pericardium to stretch over time. But once, even with a large kind of slow effusion, and once it's reached its kind of limit threshold, any further increase in fluid will slip, will, um, slip them into uh, tamponade. So yes, the amount of fluid around the heart does matter, but it's more to do with the etiology and how quickly we think that's accumulated. So again, kind of history and um, kind of symptomology, chronology of the symptoms is important with this diagnosis. So- Can I just interrupt there, Matt? Just yeah, of course you can. Share with you Karusha's beautiful pithy statement on the same topic that captures that beautifully, I think. Please do. Tamponade is physiological, effusion is anatomical. Very good, I like it. It's very true. Um, as it's kind of goes beautifully into this next slide, so to do with the kind of clinical physiological data to do with, with tamponade. So our initial assessment is obviously going to be without the, um, the ultrasound probes and a bedside assessment. So you often get the quote to kind of pulses paradoxus, um, which is, um, so anyone know what, what is pulses paradoxus? It's a decrease in blood pressure on the inspiration greater than 10%. Isn't yeah, it? it's 10, greater than, it's, um, it's, a, it's an exaggeration. Oh, it's a change, yeah, yeah exaggeration. Exaggerated of physiological response. So people often mistake pulses paradoxes. People, so you do normally get a reduction in your um, systolic blood pressure during inspiration because when you inspire, you reduce your intrathoracic pressure against relative to your atmospheric pressure. That allows an increase of um, venous return to the right side of the heart. That in slight increase in venous return increases the left, uh, the end diastolic volume of the right ventricle. So that's going to push slightly on the left ventricle. You have slightly reduced um, stroke volume on the left side. So normally, when you inspire, you will drop your um, blood pressure by a maximum of 10 millimeters of mercury. Pulses paradoxes is just an exaggeration of, of that. Um, so in tamponade, because you've got fluid around the heart, normally when the heart fills um, in diastole, it will stretch laterally and the free walls will expand. Obviously, because you've got pressure around the heart in tamponade, the, the free walls can't really expand. So the, the septum becomes kind of that expansive, that expansive part. So you just get larger swings of the septum um, from an inspiration into the left ventricle and an expiration to the right ventricle. So in inspiration, in pulses paradoxes, you're going to have greater than 10 millimeter mercury drop. However, in reality, um, measuring pulses paradoxes, you either have to have an arterial line in or you have to have a blood pressure cuff and you're measuring across the cuff uh, sounds, which I haven't done for many, many years. So um, if you actually look at the evidence around pulses paradoxes in terms of likelihood ratios, um, those of you who don't know, likelihood ratios are really good at helping to rule in and rule things out. If we're a positive likelihood ratio over 10, you can really, that's the kind of test that you would say could rule something in. For a negative likelihood ratio of less than 0 0.1, that's a test that could potentially rule something out. So if you have pulses paradoxes, it's not, it doesn't really rule in tamponade very well. If you don't have any evidence of pulses paradoxes, it's a fairly good test for ruling it out. Um, hypotension, I know one of you said earlier, this patient isn't currently hypotensive. Um, we often think of something like Beck's triad, which is found in tamponade, um, which is kind of hypotension, raised JVP, and muffled heart sounds, which no one has ever heard. Um, but hypotension itself is actually not that common. So in 34 ED patients um, with tamponade, this is from a study in 2012, these were all patients kind of in an ED that actually had a gold standard diagnosis. So they had measurements of their um, cardiac output, which improved after um, pericardial synthesis, so kind of the gold standard diagnosis. Of these, actually only 15% were ever hypotensive. 50% <clears throat> were normotensive and 35% were actually hypertensive, assumably secondary to kind of the sympathetic surge you get with um, kind of whatever the underlying etiology was. And of, the 50, of these 15%, majority of the were hypertensive were actually traumatic um, pericardial effusion, so kind of blood, which is assumed, is accumulated quite quickly and obviously more viscous. Um, the most interesting finding I thought was actually 85% of these patients are actually short of breath. So maybe that's a bit more of a sensitive marker we should be looking for patients with kind of pericardial effusions. And we're clinically assessing them, seeing if we think they've got any, any evidence of tamponade. 
So overall, um, clinical assessments, fairly low specificity. We can't really rule it in. Certain things might be able to help rule it out. Certain things. But I think it just it helps increase our pre-test probability before we get our trusty ultrasound probe out. So first thing we do when we get ultrasound probe is we have to confirm there's a pericardial effusion. So your go-to view is generally going to be your sub zippal view, your sub view. view. Uh, excuse me. Um, so the probe is um, just below the zippy sternum, um, kind of flat on the abdomen, pointing up into the up into the immediate sinum. Uh, your pointer, your patient marker is on the on the patient's left hand side. So in terms of chambers, it's right atrium, right ventricle, left ventricle, left atrium. And you can see there's a rim of pericardial fluid, this anechoic fluid outside of the heart, but in between the bright pericardium. And it stretches around the anterior border of the heart all the way down to the posterior border of the heart. And this is generally the best view to look for because you, you can fan up and down through the heart and it gives you kind of a good, good view. But with any kind of confirmation of pericardial effusion, you always want to have several views. So always confirm it with another view as well. So this is a kind of larger pericardial effusion. You can see this is a parasternal long axis view. And again, you can see there's free fluid anterior to the heart and a larger amount posterior, oops, posterior to the heart. Um, important landmark here is this, which is the descending, sorry, my video keeps freezing, descending thoracic aorta. And the fluid should track anteriorly to the descending thoracic aorta. If fluid is going posterior to the descending thoracic aorta, that's going to be pleural fluid, which can actually kind of catch people out. You can actually have both. So if you have fluid anterior and posterior, it means you've got a pericardial effusion and a pleural effusion. Um, again, kind of another view is parasitic short axis. Again, just help us confirm that there's fluid around the heart. Um, pitfalls, we've already just mentioned one. So this is um, parasitic long axis. And here's the ascending thoracic aorta. And you can see the fluid is actually tracking posteriorly to this. There's no fluid between the pericardium and the, and the descending aorta anteriorly. So this is all peri, this is all pl left pleural fluid, which often can catch people out. Um, does anyone know what this is? This is a parasternal, uh, this is a sub uh, costal view. Does anyone think this is fluid? Yeah, that's correct. That's per it's pericardial fat pad. Often doesn't appear quite as anechoic as fluid inside the heart. Obviously, this um, picture it does. But often you can see it's kind of more, it's almost kind of almost kind of loculated shape. It's normally found in the anterior, um, the AV groove. So often you'll find it on the par on the kind of subcostal view in this area, and it moves kind of more like it's attached to the heart, whereas free fluid around the heart will kind of move not quite in the synchronous uh, as synchronous pattern. And again, this is another kind of video of pericardial fat pad just at the top here. You could be forgiven for maybe thinking that as a small. Uh, pericardial effusion, but again, looking posteriorly, you can see there's no free fluid there at all, and um, it does actually look a little bit more speckled in pattern rather than the dark kind of anechoic fluid inside the heart. How and then finally, this is... Can I ask a question? Yeah, of course you can. So, how do you ha have you got any reliable methods of of ensuring that that isn't fluid? Because I get asked a lot of times to be quite definitive about whether I can see any pericardial fluid. And I know a lot of the time there isn't any, um, but you see that slight sliver and it always kind of just makes you uh, kind of doubt yourself. Yeah, you know, so you should, you should be able to, you, you should always confirm multiple views. So if you can see, if you think this is kind of, let's go back to this video, sorry. If you thought this was free fluid here, you can fan up and down often with free fluid or kind of yeah. spread more, more around anterior and posterior, where the fat pad, it just normally runs in that groove. It will disappear out of view fairly quickly when you're fanning up and down. Also, if you compare it to other views, so you go to the subcostal view, you go parasitic long, you go to the apical foreshem yeah. view. If you can't see it in any other view, it's less likely to be fluid. And it's unlikely to get such a small volume that it would be lo localized to that area, or I guess there's always possible. Yeah, so post cardiothoracic surgery, you can get loculated effusions. Um, I can't honestly say I've seen many myself, if any. Yeah, um, but um, yeah, I think that's obviously kind of quite an isolated kind of cohort of patients. Um, but yeah, if you can get loculated effusion, but I think more likely this sort of finding would be a pericardial fat pad. But yeah, if you if you look through different views, you find up and down, you should be able to kind of help differentiate between the two. Thanks. Thanks. Um, and finally, this is um, so this is a subcostal view again. Um, does anyone know what this is? <laughs> 
So your liver is normally here. So, and you can see, so Socos will be used as a right atrium, right ventricle. This is the pericardium here, just on top, and you can see the tricuspid um, valve annulus is actually moving independently from it. So this is the pericardium. So you'd expect free fluid to be here. This is all ascites. And this is the falci, this little wormy thing is the uh, falciform ligament that attaches the liver to the, um, to the chest, chest well, the abdominal wall. So you can, again, be kind of, um, falsely think this is probably a large pericardial effusion, but again, you'd expect something this big, you'd expect it to be tracking all the way around the heart. And again, you'd be confirming this with multiple views. If again, if you thought it was ascites, you'd probably uh, change probe and look in the um, abdomen as well, see if there's any evidence of free fluid. So if you do see um, kind of free fluid, well, what you think is pericardial effusion, try and find it in, in another view just to confirm. So ascites. So evidence echo of time So you found pericardial effusion. There's four things that I think you need to look for. So diastolic collapse of the atrium, right atrium, diastolic collapse of the right ventricle, the thoric IBC that Michael's already touched on, and then a bit of kind of more advanced stuff to do with Doppler, which is inflow variation um, through the mitral and tricuspid valve. The first most sensitive thing you will see is the right atrial diastolic collapse. So the right atrium is under the lowest amount of pressure of any of the four chambers. And it's it, within its cycle of diastole to systole, the lowest pressure it's ever going to be under is early systole. So if you look for the signs of early diastolic collapse of the right atrium, so you know when the right atrium is in diastole because this tricuspid valve will be closed. When the tricuspid valve is open, that's diastolic um, atrial systole. Some textbooks actually call this right atrial systolic collapse, but I get that it confuses me because it's not actually the systole of the right atrium, it's, they're talking about systole of the ventricle. So just to, for, my, for my purposes, I call it right atrial diastolic collapse, but you'll sometimes see it written as right um, atrial systolic collapse, but that pertains to the systole of the ventricle. And it's the kind of, you're looking for this finding, there's this inbowing collapsing of the right atrium um, when, the, when the valve is closed, and you're looking actually for kind of timing it through how much of the cycle it's actually collapsed in. And you're thinking it's more than a third of the cycle, it's about 99% sensitive, which is pretty sensitive. So if you're not seeing any collapse of the right atrium, um, you can pretty much say you can rule out tamponade. But it's the length of the collapse as well, which is important. Um, next thing to look for is right ventricular diastolic collapses, similar to the video Michael showed earlier of that um, tamponade case. So Parasternal long axis, you've got free fluid at the top and the bottom of the heart, and you've got the, the right ventricular abdo tract here. This is the left ventricle. And again, you're looking for this collapse of the right ventricle in diastole. Now remember, this is different to, to atrial diastole, so now you're looking for the valve to be open. So you're looking for this mitral valve here. When it opens, you want this free wall, the right ventricle, to be collapsing down. And again, you're looking for how much of the cardiac cycle that free wall is collapsing down in, and that's an important factor. So people often call this the trampoline sign. So it looks like a person on a trampoline. So if someone bouncing on this part of the trampoline, you expect the mitral valve to come up and hit it. Um, and again, it's fairly, this is fairly specific. So the right atrial collapse is fairly sensitive. This is fairly specific. Um, and again, if you see no right atrial collapse, you see no right ventricular collapse. It's got a fairly good negative predictive value for helping to rule out tamponade. Um, you must bear in mind, this is a, always think about filling pressures of the heart. So if someone's grossly hypovolemic, you're going to get much more collapse much earlier on at lower um, pressures around the heart compared to someone who's got no pulmonary hypertension. You only start getting collapse of the right ventricle light and right atrium very, very, very late in the tamponade cycle. So if someone's got pulmonary hypertension, who's showing these signs, these are kind of very critically unwell patients. For someone who's kind of grossly hypovolemic, you're going to expect to see um, collapse a lot earlier. Maybe you've got a bit more time to play with. Um, you can use M mode as well. So obviously, if someone's very, very tachycardic, it's sometimes very difficult to time it. You can pause and kind of cine screen back to see where the, um, the, the, the valves are opening. But you can use M mode because it, it's much more um, high definition, high frame rate. So M mode, you pop the line down through. This is a parasitic lung axis again. And you're looking for the right ventricular free wall, and you pop the M mode down through the mitral valve. So this is what you get. So you get a picture of this single line, but just over time. Okay. So it looks a bit of a complicated picture, but this is the this is the right ventricular free wall, and you see it collapsing in here. This is the right ventricle, 
this is the septum. This whole area here is the left ventricle. And this kind of mountain range here is the, um, is the mitral valve. This is the A wave, and this is the, sorry, this is the E wave, this is the A wave. So the E wave corresponds to early diastole. You're looking for the beginning of diastole, diastole and you're looking for this RV collapse here. So you can see where it collapses at the beginning of diastole. So this is again kind of confirming right ventricular diastolic collapse. And also this gives you a nice kind of picture to see how much of the cycle of diastolic, diastolic collapse um, you're going through. A <clears throat> um, couple more pitfalls. So we talked about kind of right ventricular diastolic collapse. So you look at this video, you can see this is parasternal, sorry, this is subcostal view again, and you can see collapsing of the right ventricle. But the important factor is if you look at the, it's not, it doesn't project very well, but if you look at this mitral valve here, this RV wall is collapsing when the valve is closed. This RV wall is collapsing in systole, not diastole. So this can catch you out. So you need to be really careful. This is systolic collapse of the RV, and you often see this in patients who are really hypotensive or someone's got a very hyperdynamic heart. So although, yes, this patient does have free fluid around the heart, and yes, they do have uh, right ventricular collapse, it's in systole, not diastole. So that would not be um, tamponade. Um, again, Michael's kind of touched on this one. So IVC, plethora. So in tamponade, you get an obstructive shock. So your right atrium can't fill properly. So the pressure is, is um, pushed back into your, into your IVC. So this is right atrium here. This is your IVC. And you're looking for a plethoric IVC. So you want to generally measure the IVC around two centimeters just before the right atrium. The reason being is that this kind of hyperechoic area here is the um, diaphragm. And that kind of artificially keeps the IVC open. So never measure the IVC here. Always measure it around this sort of area where your um, hepatic veins are. The numbers you're looking for are generally around over two centimeters with a less than 50% respiratory variation. So again, as Michael said earlier, this IVC should be collapsing down by about 50% normally. And again, that's a fairly sensitive test, but it's really not very specific at all. So you see, I'm sure you've all seen dilated IVCs, people with cardiac failure. Again, any form of obstructive shock, so someone with a large PE or a tension pneumothorax is gonna have this. So you can rule it out. If someone's got a flat IVC or uh, kind of completely collapsing in inspiration, but again, it's not really helpful for ruling in. <clears throat> and finally, for if you want kind of a bit more technical, you can look at inflow variation through the valve. So again, this is much like pulses paradoxus, but using your echo probe. So in tamponade, um, in inspiration, as we said before, you're going to get increased flow through the right side of the heart, but you'll get more increased flow in um, inspiration than you went in expiration. And the opposite happens in um, the uh, left side of the heart. So in inspiration, you're going to get reduced flow through the mitral valve and more flow in expiration. And you actually measure the difference. So normally, as I said, in pulses paradoxus, you're expecting a less than 10 millimeter mercury drop. In um, you put a, a pulse wave Doppler probe, which is an apical four chamber view, pulse wave Doppler probe, probe through the ventricle just beyond the, um, this is the mitral valve here, which you can do at the opposite side for the tricuspid valve. And you measure this is so this is the flow through the through the mitral valve. This is the E wave, this is the A wave. Um, and this is kind of difference between inspiration and expiration. And you measure the difference between the two. And you'd normally expect up to around a 10% difference in inspiration and expiration if you're reaching kind of 25% plus. Again, that's kind of evidence of, um, of potential tamponade. Again, um, Data on, on it isn't that great. Some papers will say kind of 40%, but generally looking around 25%. And again, it's not very specific. So you'll see this in someone kind of with um, COPD, with asthma, with PE, other forms of kind of constrictive pericarditis. Even if you get someone to kind of um, breathe at vital capacity, you often see this kind of finding. But if you see someone who's breathing at normal tidal volume, and you're worried about tamponade, so you're looking for kind of this, this change. So this is kind of a bit more advanced stuff, which is something to be aware of. So again, just kind of re quickly recap, echo evidence of tamponade. So first of all, you're looking for a pericardial effusion. You're looking, scanning around the heart to confirm it's a pericardial effusion. Your earliest sign is going to be right atrial diastolic collapse. It's very sensitive. And if it's more than a third of the cycle, again, that's even more sensitive. That's 95% sensitive. Um, next thing you're looking for is RV diastolic collapse. So that's when the, the valves are open. And that's very specific, up to kind of 90% specific. If you have neither right atrial collapse or right ventricular collapse, it's got a very good negative predictive value. Um, looking at the IVC, it's big and fat and not really moving much of respiration. Again, that's very sensitive. So if you have all three negative of these, you can pretty much rule out tamponade. 
<clears throat> and then inflow variation, you can use it as an additional kind of Brucey donor just to kind of get some more in, um, additional information uh, to confirm or refute your diagnosis. So going back to our patient, he was, um, he came back from CT, um, his CT, ECG gated CT aorta ruled out any form of um, dissection. Rescanned his heart again. Again, very similar findings to what we saw before. So he's still got a blood pressure around 140 over 80. Um, his pain has settled a bit now. He actually went to revisit the history. He actually had pain for four days um, and it was very positional. So it got worse when he lay down, better when he sat up. And then looking back at his ECGs, there was some, probably some subtle saddle shape at the elevation. So kind of ruling, putting all this, all, this all together, this is a pericarditis with a kind of a pericardial effusion, secondary to that. Um, patient was still fairly comfortable though, after a bit more painkillers. And again, his IVC was still big and fat and juicy. So we made the decision not to actually kind of do anything emergently, and I think that was the sensible thing to do. He went up to CCU um, for four days, um, serial echoes, and then was discharged on day four <coughs> with um, a good outcome. Um, However, so this is just to show that although we often think tamponade is an all or nothing diagnosis, so it's kind of someone who's, who's shocked and needs kind of emergent pericardial synthesis, you can have tamponade. Um, it's a very, but it's on a spectrum. So it ranges from someone who can have subtle findings like this and not many clinical findings, all the way to someone who's kind of peri arrest or, or, or in arrest and when you have to do an emergent um, uh, pericardial synthesis. As I showed previously, lots of patients with tamponade aren't ever actually hypotensive. So you'd argue that you actually want to do a pericardial pericardi synthesis in a controlled fashion before they get to the point where you're having to do a crash um, pericardial synthesis when they do drop the blood pressure, because when that happens, they're pretty much peri-arrest. So if you do have to do pericardial synthesis, kind of you are probably normally taught to do it kind of the landmark technique. So you subsifoid space just about a centimeter to the left the needle in aiming for kind of the tip of the scapula but why would we want to do that when we are so much more comfortable using ultrasound nowadays for um, invasive procedures we wouldn't dream of doing a central line now by landmark technique so i would advocate very much using ultrasound to do your pericardial synthesis for two reasons it lets you show you shows you where you're going also you very rarely actually find that when you do see someone with a large pericardial effusion you'll often find the actual biggest pocket is on the apical forechamber view when you roll them onto the left hand side or sometimes on the parasternal long axis view you'll very rarely find that it's a good place to go from the subsifoid space if you're going for that route as well rather subsifoid space you've got to tackle the liver you might prone the gallbladder you've got the ibc to contend with but if you roll them onto the left hand side and give the apical forechamber view you often find it's much closer kind of a couple of centimeters and you're into the pericardial space I'd always advocate going kind of in the in-plane view as well, so you can see the entire length of the needle rather than the outer plane view. You might be used for, used for doing kind of central lines or peripheral IV access. So just to quickly summarize, so kind of take, take care messages. So I hope I kind of convince you that tamponade is not kind of uh, an all or nothing diagnosis. It's a spectrum of hemodynamic derangement. So you, as our patient, he was tachycardic, but kind of holding his blood pressure, had some echo findings of tamponade, but again, the right thing to do with, with this patient was just to observe and do serial echoes. If he'd obviously become more, um, it's like his blood pressure was starting to drop or um, his, the length of the time the RV was collapsing, the RA was collapsing, you'd have a bit more evidence to say this is someone we're gonna try to get a pericardial, pericardial synthesis on early. Um, when you're looking for pericardial effusions, scan three different views. So view your subcostal, your long, your person along, look at your apical force and you just to confirm it. Beware of some of the mimics. So beware of your specific you know, parasitic long axis view. You're looking for don't confuse it with a um, left side of pleural effusion. Um, think about kind of the fat pads as well. And if you've got someone you think has got pericardial effusion, but they've got a fairly flat IVC and no chamber collapse at all, that effectively rules out tamponade. Um, and that's it. So happy to take questions. <clears throat> Uh, with the um, ultrasound guided pericardial synthesis that you were just describing, yeah, where you were saying um, it's uh, you, you can get better views putting the, the patient in the apical four chamber view, yeah. Where are you then uh, introducing your needle when you're doing that, or is it dependent upon what you see? It's dependent on where you really will find the biggest pocket of fluid. Really, um, you uh, if you roll them onto the left hand side and you you you've got your your ultrasound probe, you can see. You, 
you can fan around and find the biggest pocket and then you're doing it under old sign guidance so you can't really say there's one particular landmark you're going to go for it's just where just where the biggest pocket is most likely when you're doing vascular access you're getting you're getting the, the kind of the area under the middle of the probe you're kind of measuring how deep it is you can see kind of the centimeter markers on the side and then you're going kind of with um kind of live ultrasound viewing uh you can see kind of see the needle going into the into the pericardial space but often you'll find you know, if you do see a patient with pericardial effusion next time just roll them around and see see if you can if you had to um uh, find an area you'd want to do a pericardial computer with you often find it's kind of the apical porch of the view or even the parasitic along it's very rarely is it going to be the subcortical of the view which is what we're always taught to do by the landmark technique which is kind of a bit crazy but you would go but you would go on like a in through the anterior chest wall yeah. so you obviously you put some yeah. local anesthetic you could put some local anesthetic yeah. in and you'd go there because you can see if you're going that view as well you're not really going to hit the lung either again if you go parasitic along you're not really going to hit hit the lung if you're going kind of close enough to the um kind of medial spinal area obviously you risk you know you're often certain potential pneumothorax is a risk but again if you're if you're, you're going right at the apex beat and you've got a large pericardial effusion you'll often find that that pushes um, the lung out of the way. So um, once you've got your needle in um, or your pericardial effusion is hit, um, you shouldn't kind of really be, be causing any pneumothoraces. Any other questions from anyone? Would you like to make some comments? I know we've got George Nada on the line, who's mm. an expert. Would you like to make any comments, George? No, I, I, I like Matt. Uh, hello, Matt. Hello, Mike. Hi, hi, George. How are you? Hi. Yeah, <laughs> uh, it's excellent. I'm listening to this while I, I am on trauma today, uh, and it's a very, very useful. Um, I was on trauma about two weeks ago, and I had literally, as you mentioned, a stab to the left side of the chest, and uh, I did, I put the probe before primary survey. And uh, and this guy had a large tamponade and he arrested. We have to open his chest and uh, a hole in his left ventricle. And he survived the charge from the hospital today. So how useful is the ultrasound? And the other thing, Matt, which I like it, I usually, if there is, if you plan to do thoracosynthesis, uh, from parasternal long, I usually go. I don't, I don't, I don't go through the usual uh, from the subdivoid view. Mm -hmm. So it's usually from the anterior chest wall and save the lung, save the diaphragm and the liver as well. Yeah, yeah. You often find that you know you, there's so much more anatomy to kind of kind of yeah. navigate, navigate through if you're going through the subdivoid space, which is quite kind of like scary for it. Kind of like what people may have done it in the past just through landmark techniques and the kind of damage you're, you're likely to have done to kind yeah. Of yeah 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 <laughs> well most of the cardiology do it this way but a sternal long and usually usually it is very successful mm -hmm. because you can see your needle uh where it is going and and you stop just in the, in the tamponade itself not not going into the heart cool thanks george yeah, excellent. Any other questions from anyone else? Yeah, I'll just make one comment just about, um, we haven't really talked about cardiac arrest, uh, mm. but uh, I think if you are gonna use ultrasound during a cardiac arrest, uh, one of the main things we're looking for is pericardial fluid. Uh, in that context, if you think the pericardial fluid is the cause of the arrest, you know, then we should be prepared to go ahead and perform pericardiocentesis during the arrest. Um, I think there's a, there's a few misconceptions about using ultrasound during an arrest. One is that uh, the presence of RV dilation is actually not very specific for PE, and it can occur in any uh, cause of cardiac arrest. Uh, the finding of a DVT is much more specific. But if you, if you do see pericardial fluid, uh, you should be sort of mentally prepared to then act on that finding and go ahead and and drain it because there is actually some evidence from the big Gaspari paper that in the subgroup of patients who had a pericardial effusion identified and had pericardial synthesis, they actually had better outcomes during arrest. So we should be ready to do that. Cool. Any awesome. other questions? 
Karush says Pulp Fiction. <laughs> Adrenaline straight into Pulp the heart. Adrenaline, yeah, definitely. That's Karush's uh, practice. Yep. Brilliant. Well, yeah, thanks very much, everyone, for joining. Great to have such a, a good turnout. Uh, and yeah, feel free to tell your friends. We're going to try and expand this monthly, um, this regular monthly session into hopefully like a, a real pan London thing. So hopefully it'll be the first Tuesday of each month and it'll continue on as long as there's interest. Yeah. Uh, so if, yeah. If you guys have any interesting cases at any point you want to present, then we're more than happy to kind of get in contact with us and we'll kind of like, if you want to do kind of a 15 minute presentation of an interesting case you saw, um, or maybe we just have an actual one session in a couple of months time where you guys just present and we can look, you look at your images. Free, to, free, free and open to ideas. Yep, I'll just put my email address into the chat as well. Yes, feel free to get in touch. And yeah, thanks very much for joining. If Yeah, we'll try and make it a bit more organized in terms of the process. Hopefully we'll even build a website soon and we'll have all the recordings up there. Um, I think nowadays that we're doing so much teaching over Zoom, rather than just doing it all individually in our silos in our own hospital, it makes sense for us all to be doing it together and sharing knowledge. Of course, this is only one aspect of ultrasound teaching and you have to learn by the bedside as well, but there, there is a lot you can get from these sessions. So if you're interested, please uh, spread the word and give us your feedback. Great, well, thanks very much for joining. Well, thank you everyone. And if you wanna stay for me and um, while well, uh, me and uh, Angus talk about mini pigs, then you're welcome to otherwise. <laughs> it's great to see you. <laughs>